I think it's funny that our theme is frozen. God has a sense of humor. Our series, our short series of three weeks is called Frozen, loosely based, very loosely based, on the um, animated cartoon movie hit of a couple years ago on Frozen. Last week was our first week of that, talking about Let It Go. Oh, good, it didn't play. Um, <laughs> let It Go, it was not a typical message. It was talking about how Jesus is meant to carry our baggage, not us, that we are to let it go. And uh, thanks to Tony who found this picture on the internet. Awesome, I got your baggage, now follow me. That says it all for last week, wonderful. And this week, we hit another song from uh, Frozen. This week's song is for the first time. A number of people are trying to go, okay, what's that one about? Um, our take on it is this, it's a take on community and the importance, God's importance on community for us. And then after the message today, which is abbreviated, we're going to take a look at community in action and talk about our upcoming three weeks where we are privileged and honored to host the Walworth County Men's Homeless Shelter coming up. Let's pray. To God we praise and thank you for this day that we are able to be here together to worship you, to learn. We open ourselves to the work of your spirit. Holy Spirit, do whatever you want today. Thank you, God. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The third song in the Frozen movie soundtrack for the first time in forever. And taking a look at a couple different parts of it, there is, um, it's a duet between Princess Anna and Princess Elsa. Princess Anna, this one, this is not my doll. No, <laughs> this is not my doll. Uh, it does not have a restaurant. And Anna and Elsa. Oh, look at that. So it's it's a duet between the two of them. Now, the as part relates to what we're talking about today. Anna first, and these are some lines from her part of the song. The window is open, so's that door. I didn't know they did that anymore. For years I've roamed these empty halls, why have a ballroom with no balls? Finally, they're opening up the gates, they'll be actual real-life people. I'll be totally strange, it'll be totally strange. But wow, am I ready for this change. It's a yearning for community. It's a yearning to be with others, an openness to love that had been shut off uh, in the past. So that's Anna's viewpoint there. And then Elsa. And Elsa. No! That's cute. I'm giving this right to you. <laughs> and then it's, it's Elsa. And her viewpoint of community, let's take a look at her lyrics. Don't let them in, don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal, don't feel, put on a show, make one wrong move, and everyone will know. Two different views. <laughs> Does this one sing too? I'm not, I'm just holding her by the arm. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. One yearning for community, one shutting yourself off from all contact. Where do you stand? Which are you more like? Are you a person open to community? Actively seeking out relationships? Or are you isolating yourself? Saying no to invitations? Which are you most like? I give these back to you. 
The definition of community, I'll hit the second definition, is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals, the sense of community that organized religion can provide. Community is increasingly rare in our culture. Back when I was growing up, I not only knew the neighbors, I knew everybody on our block. We played together, we did a lot of things together as a community. Nowadays, we have back porches, back decks, instead of front porches. And we may not even know the name of our neighbors. With social media that's supposed to connect us to everybody, does it really, or is it just a chance to share selfies? Community is not as common as it used to be. And a practice of true community involves responsibilities and actions that do not come naturally to us. They don't, but they're important. God's call for us is not just to visit a community once a week, but to live in community. And let's take a look at what that means. Let's turn to God's word. We have about 10 verses from the scriptures out of over 25 we could have gone to this morning that cover diff different facets of God's clear call for us to live in community and what that's supposed to be like. Let's get started. A true community loves and works and meets together. Hebrews 10, verses 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one, an one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. To spur somebody on means to impel someone, to urge someone towards love and good deeds and doing that together. To not giving up on meeting together. That means to be here and to be with people. And to do this for a good reason because, as it says in the last line, as you see the day of approaching, and that's the day of Jesus coming back as he promised. We are to do that. It's God's word. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. A true community loves and works and meets together. And in a related comment, I suppose, it saddens me that the people who most need to hear today's message are not here. It's about community. And the people who need it most are the ones that we don't see. All right, on to the second one. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. A true community does life together. The fellowship of the believers. This is from right after the Holy Spirit hit on the day of Pentecost. And it talked about the church exploding um, in power of God and purpose and all of that. And this is what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and a fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So much is in that, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, powerful experiences of God, and one of my favorite parts, food. It talked about breaking bread and eating together. There's something about community when you share a good meal together. So a true community does life together. 
The third one, the true community is intimate and involved with each other. Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry each other's burdens requires two things. First of all, that you care enough to find out what other burdens are. And second, is to trust enough to be vulnerable, to share what your core issues are, not just veiled symptoms. True community fulfills the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind and your strength and your neighbors as yourself. When we live in community, when we share, when we're involved with each other, we fulfill the law of Christ. The third scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. A true community fights together against everything that attacks. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Although one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Especially, I love the part in this verse, that though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. We need to fight with others for our lives, for what God wants. To be in it together instead of against each other or trying to do it alone. We need each other. And a true community fights together against everything that attacks. The next verse. A true community speaks hard truths. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. These are instructions for what a community is supposed to do. It's to love, yes, but it's also to take people who are idle and to call them to something more. And people who are disruptive, to call them into community, working together, not against. We're to encourage and help and to be patient with others, but at times to speak hard truths. The next verse, Proverbs 17, 17. A true community perseveres through the hard times. A friend that loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. A true community is there at 2 o'clock in the morning if needed. A true community is there when others are in the most area of need. That's what a true community is. We could have gone through tons of these. We have just a few more. Um, a true community sacrifices for others. John 15, verses 12 to 13. My command, and it's Jesus speaking now. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. We hear that a lot. Well, let's take a look at the second part of this. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. To lay down our life. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? A true community, are we willing to go that far? It's what Jesus calls us to do. We know the biggest sacrifice that Jesus made for us. What is the biggest sacrifice that we have made for others? Sacrifice is serious stuff. A true community sacrifices for others. A true community forgives and seeks to restore damaged relationships. Colossians 3, 13. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
It's talking about group unity. The Holy Spirit that we seek, that we plead with when we begin to worship our God, will not come where there is unforgiveness. It will not come. And so we need to forgive, to truly forgive, and to seek to restore relationships that we have with each other. Serious stuff. A true community loves deeply. First Peter 4, 8 to 10. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Jesus rejects no one, nor should we. Love covers a multitude of sins. In the days when I struggled with forgiveness and hate, it wasn't until I was able to receive God's love and to be filled with God's love and to look with others with God's love that I was able to forgive. I called the love deeply and that love then covers whatever anybody else has done and whatever anybody else has done to us. As faithful stewards of God's grace, a steward is someone who takes something and takes it somewhere else, keeping nothing for him or herself. That's what a steward does. The gifts that God has given us are not for us. They're meant to be given away to others. A true community is committed to prayer. James 5, 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Prayer is powerful and effective. Confessing our sins to each other, that takes guts, that takes risk, and we're going to talk about that as we close today. A true community loves deeply. A true community keeps unity. Ephesians 4, verses 2 to 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Keeping unity is important. Does that mean we're mind-numbed robots? No. But it means putting the good of community above what we may think or feel even. There are these and 25 other verses that talk about the importance of being community. When we're not here, we miss out and others miss out on the blessing that you have. That's why we need each other. Rick Warren wrote something in his Daily Hope. He wrote this, Too many Christians use the church, but don't love it. This is a hard message for many of us to hear. We've been deeply hurt by members of the church. We've been disappointed. We can be discouraged. But the church is the bride of Christ. It's the hope of the world, the vessel through which God works out his plan. We have to learn to love the church. For some of us, that means there's people we need to forgive, he writes. For others, it means we need to get involved in service. And for others, it means we need to change how we talk of the church. Jesus loves his church. If for no other reason than that, we must love the church also. Community is risky. Community is messy. But it's commanded by God, and it's worth the risk. 
Anytime that we love people, we risk being hurt by people, let's be honest. Anytime we, we love, we risk being hurt by others. This is not an excuse not to love. Love is the chief thing that God requires of us and calls us to do. But we need to understand the danger when going in and to count the cost. One of Jesus' own disciples, apostles, betrayed him. And yet he risked. To risk love is to risk being hurt. Yes. But to avoid love is to lapse into a state of total self-centeredness that's contrary to everything that God wants us to be. <clears throat> Our community is a community for all. And we've set up many times through many years. A community that excludes even one member is no community at all. And I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. And your involvement in so many of the outreaches and ministries here. The encouragement that you give, the prayers that you give. That's the community. The best way to talk about community is to be a community, to be an example of Christ's love to the world everywhere that we go in everything that we do. To those who have faithfully sacrificed through these years of building this theater, this church, of leading ministries and outreaches, God bless you. Thank you for reflecting Christ so well. For those who have not been an active part, you may have come to church, but you haven't been involved and committed God says it's time. It's time. When we are a community, living, loving, learning, as Christ intended, those blessings flow. When we are obedient, to what God calls us to do as a group. Then God moves. And there are areas where that's very successful for us. And there are other areas that we believe God is calling us to that we can't because you haven't stepped up yet. Wherever God calls, He equips. Wherever the Spirit guides, He provides. Every member. That's the message. That's the message. All right. Let's take a look at one of the ways that we can build a community then. Let's take a look at our ministry to the homeless. And I'd like to invite Arvid Turner to come forward. I'd like to interview him for a while. Cheers, <laughs> Arvid. This reflects on what I just said during the message. Arvid came up to me two years ago when, when I felt led to ask him to help with the men's, Walworth County Men's Emergency Shelter. And he said, do you remember what you said? 
You said, help, that's not good enough. He said, I want to run it. Do you remember that? You were catching your first check this <laughs> My first check. How I missed those two dollars. <laughs> So I was in a good mood. But I was wowed by his response. Arvin, why did you say that that day? I had uh, volunteered for, I'm sorry. I had volunteered for about two years up in the shelter, staying at night, making meals. And I had always felt connected to the guys up there. Because I was almost there myself at one point. Um, something I've never really talked about. But, uh, there was a time where I was sleeping in my car and it was December. And sleeping in the parking lot. You know, I was starting my car to stay warm. I didn't have Christ in my life at that time. Uh, I truly felt alone. So I can kind of relate to how these guys feel. And I saw the opportunity to where I could step up and do a little bit more of it making a meal where I could actually sit and spend time with these guys and talk to them, mm -hmm. get to know them, and go above and beyond to make sure that they didn't feel the way that I felt that time that I was sleeping in my car. I remember that feeling that stays with me even though it was 12 years ago. It, it's something that's always stuck with me. Can you sense his heart? So good. All right, this will be the 10th year of the Walworth County Emergency Homeless Shelter. The 10th year. And um, there's a website that shows the number of churches that are participating, over a dozen churches, some ministries, um, and some area businesses as well that are active in doing this. And for the 10th year, um, we haven't been around for 10 years, so we can't say we were there when it started. But we've been there since we found out about it. And uh, this is something really neat. If we could take a look at the schedule. The, here are the other organizations that are active. And they ask each organization to take a total of three weeks to minister to the men from the shelter program. You can see some of our neighbor churches and, and other places as well. And looking at this, our first week coming up is January 3rd to the 9th. All right, let's take a look at the next slide, whatever that is. Oh, here are the three weeks that we have selected. January 3rd to the 9th, 31st to February 6th, and March 6th to the 12th. Harvard, what does it take to minister to the men that we have? What are the things that are required for us to do this well? You just need to love them. That's all they need. They need somebody to talk to, somebody to just show them what our community is about, which is the church's job, to love. It's that simple. They don't need money. They can use it. <laughs> they don't need it. What where they get their you know, just they just want to be treated like regular people. And can I share a story real quick? Oh, yes, about, please. about that. <coughs> As you look down on the floor you see the carpet that we have. Last year this carpet was made available to us and we just you know, it was going to take a lot of work. Each one of these seats had to come up. All the guys upstairs happened to be here that week. And they came down and they busted up. And they pulled up every chair and helped lay down the carpet. And it was just an absolute blessing to watch God really show it up. But what really floored me and set something in my heart that was a hard realization for me was that night when I was upstairs after dinner, I heard one of the guys talking to another guy. He's like, 
you know what? It felt good to work a good, hard day's work. As often as we complain about going to work every day and having a bus tom, these guys were just overfilled with a sense of fulfillment just through being able to come down and work hard for a day. You know, something's as simple as just feeling normal for these guys is what makes them happy. And they blessed us by providing the labor for that. They blessed us. Phenomenal. Okay, some of the areas that we're looking for specific help. There are a number of things. If you want to talk about any of these, Arvid. <coughs> okay, I've got a list of uh, things that I would think would be greatly appreciated in donated areas. Uh, I have a schedule of times when I need men to stay overnight. <coughs> I need people to make meals each, week, each day of the week that we're here and come and have, have dinner with them and talk with them. You know, just, just show the love that I know this church has. Uh, some breakfast items. Um, anybody that wants to donate time or a meal, or, you know, please come see me. Um, if you don't know what it is yet or where it is you can help out or if you're financially strapped, there's other things too that, don't, that aren't financial. That, you know, we talk about we can find a good place if you feel compelled to help, to serve. Let your servant heart in this fly. Because I tell you what, there is no other feeling than watching these guys just get the joy out of it. Now the program, made, the shelter opened up in November, I believe early November. Most every week, at least one guy from the shelter has come here on Sunday. From wherever they're at, they find their way here. There's two today. They come. Thank you, church, for welcoming them and all others. And do we have, oh, and so you can, you can see Arvid or Simon. Um, <laughs> see either of them. What, what? What's funny? Oh, Ar there's Arvid, winner of the chili cook-off. <laughs> He loves food. I love this guy. Can we pray for Arvid? Can we pray for the men's shelter at this time? Dear God, I thank you for your call in Arvid's life to minister to guys who are down and out. I thank you for the love that flows from him, the great heart of acceptance, encouragement, and joy. We pray your blessings, Lord, on the whole men's emergency shelter program, the directors, all the churches, all the volunteers. May we, like Arvid and Simon, reflect you well for those who need more than just a place to lay their head. They need the encouragement, the support, and the love the community is supposed to bring. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So before and after services, look for the Arvid, he'll be there um, to sign up. We ask that when people come and bring a meal, to sit down and talk with the guys. They're awesome men. They're awesome men, we love them. All right? Can I just add one thing? The guys have always said that the river is one of their favorite places to come, and that's not because of me. It's because of all of you and the love that you've shown them, and the respect. And they just, they, they rave about the river. They love it here. Thank you. The power of love. The power of seeing people as Christ sees people. The power and the blessings that come when we take our eyes off of ourselves. Listening for that voice of the Spirit calling us to do not just what we're comfortable with, 
calling us at times to really sacrifice. God knows what he's doing by asking you to be involved. He is in charge of his set up divine encounters for all of us, for all of us to do. Let's pray. Dear God, it's good that we're here this morning. We offer ourselves everything for your service. Lord, we know we're not worthy to receive you. But Jesus makes us worthy. And God, if you have anything new, anything at all, we give you permission to tell us. And we also ask for the courage and the faith needed to do what you ask of us. Dear God, we worship you now. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Coming up next week, we have a, um, our closing to the Frozen series. Um, forgot the name of the song, but it's all about the things that we fall for. The things that we fall for. And then Christmas Eve is our Christmas Eve service from 6 to 7 o'clock. The theme this year is A Shepherd's Christmas. There are cards available near the entrances to take and to give to people to encourage families one hour, just one hour, we will not go over. Come on Christmas Eve. Bye. <laughs>
children. I wonder if it gives you such joy when we're all together. It's like a family reunion. Let's sing this next song. You are good, you are good, and there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, I'll display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace. 
All right, so uh, Wes covered the announcement, which was uh, Christmas service, Christmas Eve service, and uh, now it's offering time. I want to look at the, the verse. They always throw up a verse on the screen about offering, uh, and you know, I kind of say the same thing week after week about offering, but this is actually jam-packed stuff. From 2 Corinthians, it says, each, you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, the way you, at least my family does it, we, we have our set amounts, you know, we, we just give it, we don't feel timid about giving it, nor do we feel like, you know, we have to do this, oh, people are watching, right? It's just between us and God, and uh, I don't know what more to say about that. I'm the world's worst spokesperson for offering. I just, I just do it, it's like, God, it's yours. This is our this is our arrangement. So uh, just between you, God, it's it's your thing, and uh, I pray He blesses you through it. So Lord, we, we bring to you uh, our offering, and we give just joyfully. This whole morning has been joy, and uh, you don't want it to be a compulsionary thing. It's just us and Dad. Um, so just in that same way, we, we give you reverence and. Uh, Pray that you do wonderful things with uh, the offering. And just as an additional note, thank you for uh, just a wonderful service this morning and being a God worthy of, of such worship. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I'd like to give the microphone to my friend Sandy. She just grabbed my arm to talk about how important it was for her to be able to come here today. Can I help you out, dear? I think this is, see if it's on, right? Hey, everybody. <laughs> it's good to be back home. <laughs> yeah. I had major surgery a month ago.
Please stand for your blessing. May you be filled with the spirit of joy. May you be filled with God's love. And may you spread that everywhere that you go. See you back next week. Don't forget to talk to Arvid on your way out. He'll be by the front door. God bless you.